So we also share it via YouTube, Louis. There are some, if there are some students who are not able to attend this class, so they can see it later. Should we start now? Let me check first. Teman-teman, uh, apakah semuanya sudah hadir? Hadir, Ibu. Sudah, Ibu. Okay. So, Louis, let me start this class first. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya, terima kasih buat teman-teman uh, semuanya sudah hadir. Um, I would like to um, thank you very much first to our guest lecture for this today is very special. His name is Mr. Louis Batley. Uh, he is from Actors consultant in New Zealand and he's one of my best friends when I was there he's a really kind person and is very nice he's very smart and excellent so that's why I invite him today so that he can share with you about as probably you can have some insight as the same young people uh, because he's also from the young generations who can uh, pursue what his dream in terms of agriculture sector. And um, he's from Mass University. Is it bachelor and also the master degree as well, right, Louis? So, and for your information, there are around probably around 200 students now attending our course that are coming from different courses. However, the major the major course for today is about agribusiness productions managers. And I would like to say hi also to all my colleagues, other lecturers. Uh, that are probably Pusatiani, I'm not so sure whether it is Diana and others, some other lecturers that I cannot uh, say hi one by one. And how do you want me to proceed today's activities, Luis? Do you want me to share uh, your screens and or how? Um, yeah, if I, if I can have control of the um, PowerPoint, otherwise I can do it myself or you can do it it's, and I can say change slide, just whatever you would prefer. Hmm. All right. So as another information before we start, that uh, probably the lecture sessions will run about one or maximum is one, 20 or 30 minutes. It's just in case if there is uh, more time needed. And uh, there will be around 20 up to 25 presentations. And after that, we will have discussions. For all the students, don't forget to do your uh, absence presents from the GCA, from the from our platform, and also the tasks that you need to do uh, that you take along with every course that you need for today. Thank you. So time is yours, Luis. I mean, please uh, introduce yourself. So. Just time is yours. Um, I will just share my screen. Uh, is that working? Yes. Yes, it's. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Louis Batley, and I am from New Zealand. Um, I have been working at an agricultural consultancy company called Ag First in New Zealand for the past three years. Um, and today I will tell you a little bit about the New Zealand farm systems um, and perhaps the current struggles or opportunities which, which we have for, from my um, humble view. Um, and I guess I'll just start off with some um, apologies perhaps. Although English is my first language and only language, um, I'm not great at it. So I apologize to the interpreter if they have to interpret what I'm saying, uh, best of luck. And as evident, uh, PowerPoints are not a great skill that I have. So I apologize that it's not very aesthetic. Um, so the first little part is just explaining a bit about New Zealand. I'm 
not too sure how familiar you guys are with it. So New Zealand comprises of two islands, um, which it's quite small. I think the landmass in total is about 200,000 square kilometres. Uh, I think I looked up yesterday and Indonesia might be closer to 2 million. So we might be 10% of the landmass of Indonesia. Um, the graph here, which is on the left, I, I guess is probably one of the key points about New Zealand. There is a very low population density. So the area in green is where there are no inhabitants, basically. It's all land, productive or non-productive either way, but it just emphasises that there's a lot of land and not many people. In terms of um, New Zealand itself, it's quite far south in terms of the latitude. So a very key concept is that we experience seasonality. So we have autumn, winter, spring, and summer. So temperature and rainfall fluctuates quite varied, and it has quite a considerable impact on what we can and can't grow. Unfortunately, it would be nice if we could grow some of the stuff that Indonesia grows, such as coffee and chocolate or any tropical fruit. But at the very top of New Zealand, they are trying, but with limited success. Uh, I believe they have tried to grow a pineapple, but it's taken them five years. Whereas when I was in Costa Rica, I believe that they can get two or three out and closer to two years. So um, the climate is a huge driver of our production systems, as well as being outside. Um, however, in saying that, it's quite a stable climate. It's what we call a maritime climate. So we have a predominant westerly wind um, and the average temperatures in New Zealand would probably range from eight to 13 degrees year round. And the lows might get down to less than 10 degrees, sometimes less than zero degrees further south, but quite seldomly in a lot of the country. And in terms of temperature extremes, it might exceed 30 degrees, but predominantly in the winter time, you'd be looking at 5 to 10 degrees most days, and in the summer, perhaps 18 to 25 degrees, so a very stable climate. In terms of rainfall, it's distributed quite evenly throughout the year, so it's, it's quite reliant across most of the country, which is very fortunate for our systems because they're predominantly pastoral based or grow grass. So it's very good for these systems. Another huge advantage which we have is it's an advantage and a disadvantage ultimately, but we're very isolated. There's not many countries next to us, which is good and bad because in terms of being good, New Zealand has very good biosecurity. The only way which you can get here is by boats or aeroplane, and we have stringent biosecurity measures at our borders, which you'll find out if you travel here. Um, and the only real way which things can get into New Zealand is through those methods of transport or perhaps migratory birds, which is a little bit harder, but it has meant that New Zealand has very few pests, weeds, and diseases which might occur globally where you share borders with other countries. Back to the population, there's only 5 million of us, so it's quite a small country, as I was saying. Um, and because of all these factors, ultimately, it's got quite good... Um, it's quite good for food production. It's got reasonably good soils, uh, a low population and quite a lot of expertise in agriculture as well. One of the reasons which this happened, sorry to bore you with history, but um, New Zealand was a colony from the British. So in 1840, the British came and established, well, it was prior to 1840, but they established a agreement with the local indigenous people in 1840 and since probably over a hundred year period over a century they um, cut down quite a few of the trees 
turns it into pastoral agriculture and then exported it to the UK. And everything we produced basically went to the UK. In the 1980s, there was quite a bit of turmoil globally and New Zealand had to make some quite harsh decisions. Um, prior to this, New Zealand had quite a lot of agricultural subsidies and in 1984, we lost absolutely everything. And overnight, we also lost access to our one and only market, which was the UK. So as a result of that, we had to get rid of all of our subsidies, which New Zealand would argue was a good thing, because we're, well, one thing I perhaps forgot to mention is that 80 to 95% of everything we produce, we export overseas. Because there's such a small population, domestic consumption is very limited. So we are heavily exposed to export markets and to everything else happening. So as a result of the loss of subsidies and the loss of the UK market, it forced farmers to really have to do quite a bit of stuff to stay in business. So over that time, a lot of innovation occurred, a lot of consolidation. So smaller farmers became slightly bigger farmers. And I'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. Um, and then also in terms of market access, we started looking for different countries to provide our produce to. So going down to the disadvantages, as I said, we are export driven. So commodity prices generally tend to have high volatility, especially over the last wee while. Um, and we're very reliant on trade and supply chains. So we had quite a few troubles in COVID and more recently two big factors for any export nation or trader is the conflict which is occurring on the Red Sea, which is creating problems with passage through to the Suez Canal. And then there's also very low water levels in the Panama Canal, which are two key routes for global logistics. So it impacts New Zealand a lot for our primary sector. Luckily, we have enough markets that we can sort of figure out how to get around it. But the cost of getting produce to a country is a huge factor for New Zealand. The other problem is we are isolated. And for that very reason, most of our markets, which we produce to uh, on the northern hemisphere, where the majority of um, the developing countries live, which is where we predominantly export to, um, and the other problems which we are facing is that because we have a small country, we quite often have troubles with labour shortages. And because we are very impacted by seasonality, there's a very high requirement for labour at certain times of the year and lower for others. So in terms of an employment outlook, if you are to try and employ someone for an entire year, which is very common in New Zealand to employ people sort of on a year to year basis, as opposed to a week to week basis, it doesn't quite fit into that model. And there aren't that many people who don't have a long term stable job. So that's a very big problem for New Zealand. The final problem which we're having, which all Western countries are having, is dealing with the externalities that agricultural production is having. And the three big ones is climate change. So that's predominantly mitigation, producing greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for them and reducing them. By far, this is the biggest problem for any ruminant sector globally. Water quality issues which has been a result of our intensification, which occurred post-1984 when people increased their production to try and ramp out more after the loss of their subsidies. And then biodiversity, which is starting to be talked about quite a lot globally, but there's not many frameworks around how to actually account for biodiversity. 
So in this slide here, I've just got a few pictures of what currently goes on in New Zealand. The top left picture is from uh, where I live. It's my home farm. You can see in the background, hopefully, is a big white mountain, which is a volcano covered in snow that has quite a big influence on our soil type, although luckily New Zealand uh, doesn't have too much volcanic activity compared to Indonesia, although we are on the same sort of fog lines. Um, the middle picture perhaps is my obsession with heavy machinery, but it's to try and illustrate the arable industry in New Zealand, although it's not huge, it's quite an important part. The picture on the top right of the screen is in the South Island, and I'm trying to show the diversity of New Zealand landscapes. On the left-hand corner, you've got a lot of steep hills, which is very extensive. And then on the right-hand side, between a big braided river, you've got a lot of flat productive land, of which quite a lot is irrigated. And then down the bottom is just the different industries of the primary sector. So we have sheep and beef, which is what we sell predominantly for meat and wool. We have dairy, which is milk out of a dairy cow. We have deer run in conjunction with sheep and beef sometimes. We have horticulture, so kiwi fruit is a considerably large sector for New Zealand. And then other fruit includes pit fruit, stone fruit, um, and yeah, forestry is another one which is quite big and has gotten bigger, uh, probably due to climate change policy. So a bit of economic analysis for anyone interested. This is a five-year overview from something called the Sector Outlook Primary Report, and it breaks down what the big industries are in New Zealand for the primary sector. On the top, which is the biggest, is dairy, followed by meat and wool, forestry, horticulture, and seafood. Um, it fluctuates quite a bit throughout the year, but I guess that the key takeaway is combined of our total export value, makes up 60% or 60 to 70% of New Zealand's entire export revenue. Dairy alone is close to 30%. So if you're looking at it from an economic perspective, almost our entire exports are from the primary sector, which is quite unique for a developing country. Um, and the other thing is just to note the percentage of year-on-year -year change it fluctuates considerably. Uh, there's a few driving forces behind this. One is the exchange rate of the New Zealand dollar. We have what is known as floating exchange rate. So if we have a low dollar relative to the US dollar, then we will get a higher export revenue. Another factor is your production based on seasonality, so some seasons are worse than others, which ultimately drives your production. Um, and then another is just simply market supply and demand based on what other countries are exporting what. Um, so I'll talk about two industries in New Zealand which are quite large. Uh, the first is dairy. So in terms of global dairy exports, New Zealand is one of the biggest players in this market because not many people export dairy produce. It's more domestic consumption. So although we might be one of the biggest dairy exporters in the world, in terms of actual dairy production, we may have 1% of global dairy, if that. Um, so... The dairy industry is predominantly made up of cows, but more recently, as people try to diversify, we have seen some goats and sheep being milked. Um, there were some crazy people in the South Island who tried to milk deer as well. Um, it was interesting. The average 
dairy farm size in New Zealand is 157 hectares. Um, and on this, there would be 449 cows. So hopefully that gives some context as to the current size of what we're doing. Over time, you can sort of see in the top right hand corner and below it, I've made two graphs. One shows the number of cows in New Zealand. So since sort of the 1990s, a lot of flat land has been converted from sheep and beef into dairy because it has higher economic returns. And then the next one below is what you would call intensity, which is simply how much milk are we producing per cow. And this is also another important metric which we look at. You usually associate it with genetic gain or there might be some additional supplementary feed inputs. But we like to see that going up, which means that for every cow we have, we're producing more milk per cow. And that's ultimately to try and increase on-farm efficiencies. And it's definitely one of the key drivers which the New Zealand primary sector are always looking at. The graph in the bottom right-hand corner probably just sort of helps to understand that there's also been a lot of consolidation occur in the industry. So the green line is the number of cows per farm and the gray line is the number of farms. So what you can see is that you've got a decreased number of farms, but an increasing herd size. So that's just consolidation. Some farmers are exiting the industry and then other farmers are buying these farms out to make their farms bigger. There is some land use change going into horticulture, but it is a very small percentage of that. Um, and I guess just to highlight over the last five years, this has been probably a bit to do with the regulatory constraints which are occurring in New Zealand in terms of environmental aspects, which I'll talk a little bit about later. In terms of the ownership, it's quite varied. So you have family farmers who would most likely be your 100 to 200 hectare farm with three or four or 500 cows. Um, there's corporate structures, which are quite a bit bigger. So corporate companies have come in uh, perhaps over the last decade, 15 years, bought big farms, and then sort of have an investment model where they're hiring out the land which they own, getting people into contract labour and then having it as an investment, which you can do. Also, uh, the Indigenous people in New Zealand, um, the Māori, they have some ownership in the space as well, which is deemed Māori agribusiness, and that makes up a small percentage of the dairy. And then there's also a little bit of government investment um, there's a company called Pamu or Landcorp formerly and they own farms as well and that's quite often where you see a little bit of innovation occur so that the dairy industry control certain things on these farms. So the farmers largely own the farms and they're quite um, at, in, in terms of the inputs they don't have a lot of say and once they produce their milk, it will get picked up by a truck and sent off to get dried into milk powder. Because the problem with this commodity is that it's very, um, it has to be stored and sent overseas. So the majority of it is either sent into, processed into milk powder or something else. And the processes is predominantly Fonterra, which is a farmer led cooperative. They're about 80% of the market share. So it's just about a monopoly, although there's a lot regulating from them from preventing that from occurring. Um, I can talk more about cooperative structure if anyone's interested. Uh, and then you've got a few smaller players making up the remaining 20% of the industry. One is two are cooperatives and one is a corporate. Um, that's probably about all that on the dairy industry. The second would be the red meat industry. So this is sheep, beef, and deer farms. 
These farms are slightly bigger but more extensive. So the average size of a farm is apparently 270 odd hectares um, across New Zealand, although they range considerably from 100 hectares to perhaps 15,000 hectares. So I think the more extensive ones down the South Island. Um, the average animal numbers is about 2,800 sheep, 390 cattle and 31 deer. But looking at those numbers, I suspect something's going a bit wrong because that's too high a production. That might be more likely to occur on a four or 500 hectare farm. But it was just what our industry body had to say. Um, in terms of the ownership structures, very similar to the dairy industry. Uh, and with the processes, the same sort of quite quite different. And instead of being a monopoly, you've got five big processes, uh, which is Silver Fern Farms, Alliance, AFCO, um, ENSCO, and then, well, yeah, well, there's a couple of others, but a lot more competition in the industry. Um, and... Uh, yes, it's quite different, but basically you send your animals live to these companies to get slaughtered. Uh, they'll do the processing, and then all of this just gets sent overseas. Very small percentage of any of it actually is retained in New Zealand. Um, so just glossing over some of the problems and opportunities in New Zealand... The main problem which farmers will always talk about is government regulation. And ultimately, I'll talk about it more, but we can't intensify anymore. We've probably capped the number of inputs which we can put into the farm system without leading to further externalities. Um, in terms of global trade, there's quite a bit of protectionism which is occurring. It's a, quite a big rise of populism. So you can see the likes of Donald Trump in Argentina, they've just elected a new president who's quite populist. Uh, I know that you guys had elections earlier in the year, not too sure what he's like, hopefully good. Um, but in terms of the trade scene, it's quite a worry for us. We are very reliant on free trade agreements because the free trade, the World Free Trade Organization or the double WTO um, lost a bit of jurisdiction around trade. Yeah, this is a, quite a big risk for us. I guess, where do we send our products if no one will take it? Um, in terms of the farmers at a farm level, increasing interest rates in New Zealand, um, for a developing world, we'd say that it's high. For a developing country, you'd laugh at us because if we think that above 3% year-on-year inflation, our, our central bank's target interest rates are 2% to 3%. Hopefully that gives you guys some context. So last year on farm, farm inflation was 15%. Usually you would expect it to be 5%. Uh, that's the reality of the developing world, and I feel stupid <laughs> to this to perhaps Indonesia, where inflation is probably likely to be quite a lot higher. But for us, that's really, really big. So what this has meant is that we've had an increase in costs and largely the farm input costs and then largely a same or decreasing on farm income. So the farmer in between is getting squeezed quite a bit and um, farm profitability has decreased as a result. We're still facing labour shortages. Uh, in COVID, New Zealand decided to lock the country down entirely. So you could get out if you'd like, but not get back in. And it basically meant that we're quite reliant on people coming in for labour. Um, so that was quite an issue. And then I guess technology uptake is quite slow and expensive as well. In terms of the opportunities, which we see, um, robotics is slowly coming in. So the first picture is a Lely automatic robotic where cows will milk, walk into a station and be automatically milked. So ideally no human labor involved. Um, hopefully that sort of takes off. This 
The slide down is something we call agrivoltaics. So New Zealand needs to generate more electricity as we de-intensify our emissions over time. So we need to increase our renewable electricity consumption. One such way of doing so is solar panels. So we're trying to combine solar farming and livestock farming together. I guess it's land use diversification to a degree. The graph below that is showing yield mapping. So a huge opportunity for us would be satellites and what's happening out in space and what we can measure from a laptop as opposed to having to walk out on the farm because in New Zealand, 150 hectares is quite big to walk over on a day-to-day -day basis, especially the big farms, which are pushing well over a thousand hectares. So an opportunity, well, it's an opportunity because some people might not be visiting certain paddocks for two or three weeks at a time. Uh, the next two is Farm IQ and Halter, which Farm IQ is basically trying to digitize the farm management and put everything online in conjunction with mapping so that you can see what's happening as you do it and get real-time data. The one below that is a New Zealand company called Halter, which looks at cow collars, which monitor what your cow is doing um, and can provide life, real-life data so if you have any subclinical disease, it should inform you, as well as production statistics. On top of that, they have virtual fencing. So you should be able to tell cows where they can and cannot go, which is quite a big opportunity. And the bottom right-hand corner is what we call carbon neutral produce, which is where there aren't emissions involved or they've been offset by sequestration. And this is an opportunity which we're looking into as well. So I think from, from my perspective, the key, um, sorry, hopefully I'm not going too long over time, the, the three big problems which we have, is everything okay? All good, all good. Okay, I'll, I'll wrap up in, in as quick as I can. So there's three big things which I think are facing developing countries which are what you call externalities, and this is essentially pollution. Uh, the Western world is becoming quite focused on this. So from New Zealand's perspective, we've got two very big problems, which is water quality. Our agricultural practices um, perhaps have led to a decrease in water from contaminants. We have got climate change, um, biodiversity, and then also forestry for us, exotic forestry is creating some problems. Um, so the first I'll talk about is climate change. The graph which is up there is very unique for a developed country. 50% of our emission profile is from agriculture. Perhaps in other developing countries, it might be five or 10%. So this is very unique for New Zealand and also quite a big problem for us. Um, as a way to address the policies which are occurring, I'm not sure how much you guys know about climate change, but there was a thing called the Paris Agreement, which is telling us that we need to reduce our emissions um, as a country by meeting specific targets, which we've signed an agreement to get. Um, so as a way to try and integrate this into our farm systems, uh, a lot of New Zealanders have measured their emissions using specific tools. So hopefully at the end of the year, all farmers know what their greenhouse gas emissions are on farm and have a plan in place to be able to measure them or to try and reduce their impacts. We were the first country in the world to try and price agricultural emissions, which was incredibly controversial. <laughs> um, I'm happy to talk about that later as it was part of my job. Um, and I guess in terms of finance, we've had things such as sustainability linked loans, green loans and green bonds. So you've got regulation from the government 
And then you've got finance from the private sector, which is also pushing this. So there are a lot of reasons as to how we can do it. Another thing is that consumers who we are exporting our produce to are expecting us to reduce our emissions. Um, and we're trying to invest in ways to reduce emissions on farm or to change it. But it's very hard to do. Um, and the other thing which I'll talk about is the impacts of climate change. Um, so last year, we had a cyclone, which isn't normal for New Zealand because we're very far away from the equator. We don't have cyclones. It's very out of character for us. Uh, so the top two photos are just short of showing what this flood did, which we would say is equivalent to one in a hundred years. And the bottom picture sort of shows another problem with erosion so all of that brown all those brown dots are landslides or scars in the uh, hills which we have all of that sediment will end up in the waterways which is a bad problem and it's also a massive loss of productive land um, so that was quite a shock and last year in terms of insurance claims I think that New Zealand had the highest weather-related insurance claim in the world on a per capita basis, which is uh, quite scary for us as we're very reliant on insurance. Um, but I'm sure that climate change is um, uh, at front of mind for all of the world. The second one is water quality. So as a result of agricultural intensification outdoors, we've increased fertilizer application, which is nitrogen, phosphate, then we've also increased um, erosion. So you have sediment getting into the waterways as well as some E. coli with livestock getting into the waterways. Um, and we are trying to address these problems through a change in management practice, which we call best management practice. Uh, if you look up certification schemes such as Global Gap, they're all quite well documented. Um, so this, for dairy farms, is better storage and application of effluent. We're trying to exclude stock from waterways and plant what we call riparian margin, which in that bottom right-hand corner, you can see there's a bunch of trees and stock exclusion. And the idea is that it attenuates nutrients or collects any dirt or anything or nutrients underground to prevent it from getting in the waterway. We've also got proof of placement maps with fertilizer so we know where it's going, how much is going on and when, so we can change our management based on that. So there's been a small amount of land use change which is increasing, whether that's to forestry or to horticulture to try and reduce the runoff or fertilizer requirements. And then also regulation. So for the past five years, we've had a lot of reforms from the government who have told us that farmers can no longer do things the way which they were once done. And we've also had our first ever input restriction, which is very unlike New Zealand. From a policy perspective, New Zealand tends to regulate outputs. So you calculate what would be coming out of your system and regulate that as opposed to what goes into the system. That's more of a European Union or America type policy requirement. Um, and another one which we're talking about quite at the moment is forestry. So forestry is good in many ways as it can prevent erosion and increase carbon sequestration as well as diversify income on farm. However, this is exotic forestry, not indigenous forestry. So when we talk forestry, we mean one exotic species such as Pinus radiata. However, it's become apparent that our harvesting practices, which occur on quite steep land, are not deemed to be sustainable. So we do what's called clear fowl, where we cut them down all at once. It results in a lot of wood waste or slash, which ends up in our waterways. Um, and basically, there's a lot of scrutiny as to how this is being done. Um, and a lot of the land use conversion into forestry occurred because of climate change policies. So we're now looking at what we say, right tree or right place. Uh, but it's also controversial. 
And finally, I'll just touch on biodiversity loss. So this is going to be perhaps the next big thing in New Zealand and developing countries. We need to figure out what our impact has been on biodiversity, how we can maintain, if not improve it. Um, and it might be big. We looked at a biodiversity credit and there's global initiatives going to try and get this up, which is a bit like a carbon credit. So I think that this space will be quite interesting in the future. Uh, and finally, I'd just like to make a disclaimer that I've probably exposed you to the worst aspects of the primary sector in New Zealand. In general, these issues aren't as widespread or as big. But in saying that, if we don't address them, they're going to become quite a big problem. And those are just two photos of the New Zealand natural landscape. So the top one is a walk which you can do called the Milford Sound, and the bottom are some springs called the Patararu Springs. Um, so it's not all doom and gloom. <laughs> it's just problems to be aware of. Um, and finally... That's my email address. You're more than welcome to send me emails if you have any questions. Um, and I'd just like to thank Dwi for allowing me to speak and make the most of her because she's a fantastic person. Um, so I'll now open up to any questions. So thank you very much, Louis. And uh, by the way, I love the picture. That was when we were in Aifama in Lincoln. Was it? Sweet. So allow me to speak in Bahasa Indonesia for a while, just to make sure that my students understand what they heard just now. Teman-teman, uh, bagaimana kalau ada pertanyaan, silahkan uh, ngomong langsung boleh bagi yang ingin praktek Bahasa Inggris, ngomong langsung, nggak usah takut. Beliau orang baik, kalau ada yang nggak bisa, bisa saya bantu translate. Silakan. Feel free for any students, any lecturer, if you have any questions. Probably I will just try to open three questions for the first sessions. Gimana? Bahasa Inggrisnya bisa didengar atau susah? Bisa ya? Oke. Okay. Ayo, siapa yang mau bertanya? Saya persilahkan, bisa tertulis, bisa secara langsung. Kalau saya sih biasanya suka langsung ngomong Inggris salah-salah, nggak -salah, masalah gitu loh. Karena itu cara kita belajar. Any students from any class? Uh, what? Uh, let me try some question. Sweet. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, First of all, uh, I'm sorry if my English is bad. <laughs> so uh, in one of the slides, you show the impact of disaster due to cyclone. In Indonesia itself, there is a program called uh, Asuransi Usaha Tani, which is if agricultural land is hit by natural disaster, will get compensation. So is there also the programs, uh, also the same program in New Zealand? Thank you. Sorry, I will try to translate the questions. Oh, no, I, I got that. Did you know that about the insurance yeah. suite? No, Perfect. Your, your English is very good, but far better than any other language I can speak. Um, I, I think that it's a conversation which is to be had. So we do have some relief support packages. The central government operates uh, called Ministry for Primary Industries, and they released some funding. However, it's a conversation which is yet to be had for, well, globally. Um, the term is called managed retreat. So other than agricultural land, you've also got infrastructure in New Zealand, which is highly exposed to climate change. So this is anything which is on a hill, which is likely to go sort of a landslide. Um, Houses next to the ocean, which could be impacted by sea level rise, or houses next to rivers or in natural flood areas, which might flood. Ultimately, insurance companies have quite often insured this event from occurring. 
So you can get insurance who will pay out if you have a natural weather disaster, but the insurance industry are now quite worried about this and some of them are starting to refuse to insure people. Um, I think the conversation of managed retreat is to try and remove your infrastructure from exposed places and to relocate it to better positions. And I'm not sure how it will play out on farms. They have done this in certain places in New Zealand to relocate the infrastructure, but the conversation becomes, when do we tell people to move? How do we tell them and how much do we pay for? And it's the same sort of question for these cyclone events which occur. We've had compensation from the government and some from the insurance industry, but if these keep happening, it's not financially sustainable to continually hand out money to people who are impacted because it will ultimately cripple the New Zealand economy. As insurance companies become less willing to insure, the New Zealand government has to make these harsh calls. So we do have it. How long we'll have it for is a very interesting question. And how we have the conversation about it is also very interesting. But managed retreats is the concept which you're probably referring to if you'd like to look into it, but very controversial. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, is there any other questions? It's interesting. It's about insurance. Any other questions from other students from the agribusiness management productions, risk management, dari management risiko, SEB, komunikasi bisnis, barangkali? Silakan. Khusus untuk yang manajemen produksi agribisnis, uh, sesuai dengan arahan ya, jika ada yang bertanya, maka sesuai dengan arahan. Please, anyone who would like to have a questions? I myself have some questions, but I would like to allow my students or other lecturer to come up with a question. Ms. Ratna, you... can I... Uh, yes, please. Yes. Okay. Yes, please, Mrs. Satiani. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, Luis. <clears throat> uh, I have some question. Uh, maybe only one. Okay. Uh, about the beef production in New Zealand. Uh, what is the uh, government policy that's supporting the production of uh, beef or dairy? Uh, in uh, New Zealand because uh, we know that uh, the beef and uh, another dairy product uh, of New Zealand is uh, so big uh, for the export. Okay, thank you, Luis. Oh, thanks for the question. Um, the way which the industry is set up, I, I guess when you talk about government support, it goes back to the subsidy thing. So... New Zealand perhaps might have one or two percent agricultural subsidies, which predominantly occur at the university level. So New Zealand's primary sector have what you call industry bodies. So we pay a levy to an industry good organisation who in turn put it into research and development and extension for the farmers. So for the beef industry, it's called beef and lamb. And for every animal you send to the meat works, a few dollars is taken off each carcass and goes towards that organisation. From the government itself, we have things called Crown Research Institutes. And these are partly government funded, so it would also be where you get the funding. So... There's one called Ag Research or Agricultural Research, and they do a bit of research, which is partly subsidised by the government as well. Um, however, getting their research uh, and commercialising it or 
having an extension service is a bit of an important link to be able to communicate to farmers what's currently occurring. Um, but as it currently stands, oh, and I should also mention the meat processors will put a little bit of money back into specific research and development as well, especially the cooperatives, so uh, farmer owned. But the way the industry is set up, it comes from the industry good organisation, which is funded by levy payers, i.e. the farmers. But the government, not hugely into it because the way that they see it, um, well, I guess MPI sort of has a little bit, but that's sort of how it's set up. But no no, no subsidies, I, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. So it's um, you can't give the agriculture industry too much money in terms of research otherwise other industries in New Zealand will get upset so a bit political awesome okay, thank you <laughs> yeah interesting I, uh, I, I kind of it's the interesting one is research and the industry works very well in New Zealand the same with Australia but in here it seems like it's just it separated, we go research by ourselves, and while the industries just go with what they have been here. I think, uh, so Mrs. Satyani is from the economic uh, agriculture field area, and she's one of our lecturers. She so just finished her PhD in Taiwan as well. And I mean, it's the same, almost the same batch with me. So is there any other question from others? I invite everyone, come on first. You can hone your English skill and try to speak with a native speaker. <laughs> and then the second one is you you understand that it's really far different between New Zealand, how they handle their farm business and Indonesia. Uh, I believe Louis already know that our business probably is just less than one hectare and we already call them farmers. So that's well, some what you explained to us probably just opened our students mind that probably you're just a couple years ahead than our business in here. Silakan untuk teman-teman. Berani aja, saya lihat ada yang pinter bahasa Inggris juga itu. Ayo silakan. Meskipun enggak bisa bahasa Inggris, silakan bertanya bahasa Indonesia nanti saya bisa bantu translate. Anyone? If not, uh, probably. Uh, okay, okay, go, go. Ibu, izin bertanya dan izin nanti minta bantuan di bagian okay. jawabannya untuk mm -hmm. di sedikit bantu untuk translate-nya, Bu. Boleh, boleh. Uh, I have a question. Can I ask? Why is yes. a population of around 5 million people included in the affected even tooks? If the population is male, it will result in a lack of labor. And the razor bleach in the PPT also explains this. And why the budget for technology absorption is still low there? Um, so, Liz, can you can you get the question? I, I think so. The first part was on um, the gender dynamics of the population. Was that right? Oh, hold on, I'll try to confirm. Uh, and is your question is about the small populations in New Zealand related to what? Sorry, I cannot get your question. In the first one. Pertanyaan pertama sayang tentang apa tadi? Populationnya uh -huh. kecil. Ya, seperti ini bukan di PPT dijelaskan bahwasanya keuntungan di apa berbisnis di New Zealand itu juga tadi <tuh> mengenai uh, populasi yang kecil sekitar 5 juta orang. Nah, tapi di lain hal di PPT juga dijelaskan bahwasanya di sana itu mengalami uh, kekurangan tenaga kerja. Artinya uh, populasi yang kecil itu kan tidak memberikan keuntungan dari sisi penyediaan tenaga kerja. Terus pertanyaan saya yang kedua, mengapa di sana anggaran biaya untuk uh, penyerapan teknologi masih sedikit gitu? Alright, so there are two questions, Louis. Please allow me to. I try to reinterpret his questions. And uh, as you see, that New Zealand has only five million. I mean, small populations. 
but you mentioned that there is a very beneficial if you do business in New Zealand. However, due to this small populations, you also have a labor shortage. How do you, I mean, this kind of contradictions, according to him, probably you need to be explained again. You have small populations, but you see that this is a very beneficial business for, in the farm in New Zealand. However, you also have a labor shortage. How do you deal with this? That's the first question. The second is, um, due to, related to the first question, the technology budget, is it correct that it is still very small in New Zealand? It just tried to confirm, I mean, did you get my question? Or? Um, the second part was it about a budget. Oh, just to... Disclaim, um, I'm not giving my answers in, in Indonesian, so don't feel obliged to ask a question in English. Uh, what, what was the second part of the questions? Oh, I can the, probably address the labour part and then go to the yeah, second uh, part of the The question. second is about the technology. The technology, um, is it correct that the technology allocation in New Zealand is still very small? So... Why does New Zealand, you have a labor shortage, you have a small populations, and why yeah. do you still allocate a small portion for the technology? Um, well, I guess going to the labor thing first and foremost, um, so we've got specialization in the labor force for agriculture. Um, so you can sort of meet supply and demand, but if you look at it from an economic perspective, you've got a labour market and some people enjoy living on the farm, others not so much, but the easiest way to address supply and demand is to simply pay more. The other thing that we have uh visas I guess which you could call which is seasonal labour or REC residual seasonal employment schemes so we go overseas and we'll find people who would like to work in New Zealand for a season through agriculture so I guess that's relatively common globally I've worked in Australia and Canada on similar such visas um so the other way of looking at it is to try and make the job easier, which comes down to how good are people at employing. It's a discussion which we're having in the sector currently is how to be a good employer and how to make people want to work for you. Um, but it's a different sort of technical skills, which perhaps farmers don't all have. Um, but it's definitely a problem, and it always has been a problem, but we are trying to address it and definitely technology might be a part of the solution. The reason that it's not taken up so quickly is because a lot of it is still in its preliminary phases and very expensive. You've got early adopters who would take it up, but unless you are eliminating a labour unit or getting substantial increase in production, which is larger than the cost of implementing the new technology, there's no real incentive to do it. So I showed some cow collars, um, which were from a company called Halter, and they have quite a benefit, and it's talked about at the moment. But if you don't have a big enough farm, which I think it's about 700 cows, which is sort of bigger than your average size farm, it's very hard to justify it to not have a labour unit. Probably stepping back a bit further, when we talk about labour, we mean someone who spends the entire year on the farm, it's their full-time job. Then you have other people who might come and help every now and again, which we call casual labour. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the technology thing is, it's still very expensive um, and currently farmers don't have much money. So there's quite a bit going into it. Um, but I mean, <laughs> well, obviously we get the work done. Some people have to work a little bit harder, 
But I don't know if it's ever not going to be an issue unless technology always solves it. We've had this issue oh, probably since we started farming. Um, so, yeah, it's just a problem we have to deal with. I don't know what if we'll ever have a solution. It's, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll sort it out. <laughs> I see. Um, yeah. Can I just try to retranslate what you say to my students? Um, just a short close second. Uh, jadi, teman-teman, uh, bahwa yang dilakukan di New Zealand itu biasanya mereka ada labor season ya. Jadi mereka nanti mengambil labor atau tenaga kerja itu dari negara lain, dari Bangladesh, dari kebanyakan dari mungkin Philippines juga masuk ke New Zealand untuk menjadi para pekerja. Solusi yang kedua adalah teknologi. Dan memang untuk invest pada teknologi itu minimal tadi dia bilang misalnya kalau nggak punya minimal 700 sapi itu rugi banget dia gitu. Dan teknologi itu memang benar-benar besar banget diterapkan di sana. Jadi karena memang yang punya farm Farmnya ratusan hektar, kemudian kalau dia mengandalkan pada orang saja kayaknya nggak cukup. Nanti akan ter saya terangkan lebih jauh pada saat itu ya. So, uh, Louis, are you happy with the answer, Aan? Yeah, Ibu. So, hold on for a moment. Louis, uh, are you still okay? If we still continue with probably three more questions, I mean, I'm afraid that you already mentioned the one hour, but... Oke, okay, oke. Okay. Kalau ada yang bertanya lagi, silakan. Saya Bu. Ya. Siapa namanya? Mungkin dikasih tahu juga ya. Halo, Miss, Miss, eh, Mr. Louis, Abriska. Uh, I have an equation. I heard from Mr. Lewis that there are two big problems in New Zealand, and one of them is water quality. If the water quality has an impact on agriculture, what is the biggest impact of the problem? Is there any government regulation other than mitigation to overcome the problem in New Zealand? Thank you. Uh, good, good question. I, I should specify that the problem isn't the water which comes from the sky or what we use to irrigate it's the water which ends up in the waterways which goes out to sea um, recreationally people like to swim in waterways and do water sports and stuff so you decrease the quality of these people the lives of these people um, and it's gotten a little bit worse over time So people have definitely recognized this over the last decade, um, going back to when we consolidated and intensified agriculture post-1984 or whenever you want to talk about it. We put a lot more fertilizer on, which meant that we had more fertile soils. And when the rain hits the soil and is filtrated and goes back into the waterways, It collects these nutrients and becomes fertile water in essence. And fertile water leads to nutrification, which results in bad water quality. So we have a piece of legislation called the um, Fresh Water Act, I guess. And they're currently trying to set targets to meet in terms of water quality. And the way which they have regulated which occurred probably last year, was waterway exclusion. So they said no more animals in waterways. So that was one thing which was um, probably not bad. A bit more to it than that. Another was the amount of nitrogen fertilizer which is applied to partial land. So they said no more than 200 kgs per hectare per year, which is a quite a large amount of fertilizer to be fair. Um, then they've also, we do something called winter grazing. So over the winter time, we can grow a fodder crop and then it's quite intensively grazed. And they've created a bunch of standards for intensive winter grazing, which came into effect two years ago. 
these are minimum requirements that you must meet and you have to get a consent if you cannot meet them. Um, so in short terms, yes, there's been a lot of government regulation and as an outcome, it's probably increased the farmers' expenses uh, and perhaps capped their ability to intensify further to some extent, which isn't true. But I guess we should have been doing these things since we started farming because it is best management practice um, ho hopefully that answers your question, but short, short answer, yes, a lot of regulation and, and more to come in the future, I suspect. Gimana? Are you happy dengan jawabannya? Uh, paham? Siapa tadi namanya ya? Saya lupa. Enough food. Sweet. Thank you, Rizka. I will open two more questions. Ayo, kesempatan lo ya. Uh, saya Bu. Silakan, Elhat. Ayo, silakan. Kau perkenalkan namanya juga ya. Hello, Mr. Luis. I am Aisha. I have one question. Currently, the the export process is quite. It's strict because it pays attention to all aspects. So how does New Zealand hand, handle that? Did you get the question, Louis? Or do you want more? Uh, she wants to repeat once again? Uh, perhaps repeat it. I, I think my answer is... <laughs> so because I didn't get... No, no, I didn't get it as well. Uh, tolong diulangi lagi, though. Agak ini. Agak pelan. Gimana? Maksudnya gimana? Diulang lagi. Currently, the export process is quite strict because it pays attention to all aspects. So, how does New Zealand handle that? Yang expert, sorry, sorry, saya yang agak ini. Gimana expertnya? Apakah boleh saya minta bahasa Indonesia yang versi bahasa Indonesia gimana, dok? Uh, kan gini, Bu. Sekarang kan itu proses ekspor atau impor itu kayak agak sulit soalnya kayak negara-negara itu memperhatikan dari aspek yang ditimbulkan dari dampak pertanian atau lain sebagainya. Jadi, bagaimana New Zealand mengatasi hal itu gitu? Ah, uh, I see. So it is about export import which is uh, currently there are more impact in the global market. How does New Zealand there are more requirement with those climate trends and everything. I think she's, she's talking about the more sustainable that is standard in the export import. How does New Zealand deal with this? Um, well, I, I guess the exports, uh, you have minimum standards. So basically, the entire of the industry would have to produce something which would meet these export requirements. So because we're predominantly export driven, any on-farm practices should really be implemented so that it can meet global standards. Um, in terms of how the government deals with it or at a trade level, it's down to our free trade agreements. Uh, so we have a bunch of um, negotiators who sit around tables and wear fancy suits and they negotiate with other countries around our ter terms of trade. So New Zealand um, puts quite a bit of time and effort into making sure that we understand what our obligations are in terms of our um, trade agreements. Uh, that That's probably about as good of an answer as I can give you because <laughs> I'm not super into trade, but... Um, Free, free trade agreements is, is pretty much, yeah, we have to know what is going on globally, uh, otherwise we're poached. So we just have to deal to what people ask for. We're, we're price takers, not price makers. We don't sell produce in our country. So we just have to figure out what people want and then figure out where our produce is to go and, and how we get it there. Um, yeah, I, I see someone's put a question in the chat. Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. No, sure, sure. So, yes. So I believe that just now that you already answered the question. There's another question coming from our students. 
Uh, do you want me to read it? Or I would like to ask I you about GHG <laughs> emissions. All right. Ah, uh, not super well. <laughs> we, we got a new government and they sort of pushed, extended the time frame, uh, unfortunately. So the what happened was the last government, which perhaps was a bit more left and now we've gone right in the political pendulum, um, they went and really... Um, decided, okay, we need to give a signal to farmers that they have to reduce their emissions. Um, and in order to reduce their emissions, because it's a huge percentage of the country's emission profile, well, I should probably declare that globally we might be 0.5% of the world's emissions, but we still have to do something because if we don't, it's the world's doomed to fail. Um, I guess we have learned a lot about calculating emissions in the process. That's quite hard to get accurate farm data to actually be able to accurately assess emissions. I think there's quite a lot of stuff which should be working in this space. In terms of mitigations, you, there are some, but we're very reliant on technologies which don't exist yet. Um, and how it was priced was political because, well, okay, it never can't be, but at what at what price do you send a signal to farmers that tells them to change their behaviour but doesn't destroy certain industries? And the other half of the equation, we had carbon sequestration, so everything was linked to a carbon price. It's called an emissions trading scheme, so you price carbon. If you grew trees which hadn't been grown before, you'd get paid for sequestration, but that became so profitable that it converted a lot of land which would have been producing food into forestry, and it, perhaps forestry wasn't the most productive use of the land, you could also argue that a carbon credit is not value addition, it's simply an internal cost. So economically, you're not really doing much econ for economics. Um, so very, very complicated. Um, we still are yet to decide what we're going to do. But to be fair, we were the first country in the world to do it. And I think everyone else will have to have this discussion. Um, but yeah, I, the politics five years that's a problem for five years' time. That's ultimately what's happened. Um, hopefully, that sort of answers your question. Awesome. Um, we have uh two questions, and I'm not so sure whether you still have time. There are, there are more questions. I, th I saw a student's hand try to put the hands up. Where is it? Does it count? Kara. Kara, di mana dok? Tadi kayaknya ada yang hands up deh. Um, iya ibu. Oh, sebelumnya saya mau bertanya ibu. Uh, tadi itu kalau nggak saya, saya mendengar mengenai Christ Cultural atau Christ Church ya ibu. Gimana Christ Church? Iya. Uh, tadi saya takut salah mendengar mengenai Christ Cultural atau Christ Church. Mungkin saya nggak apa, mungkin Christchurch ya, nama salah satu wilayah di New Zealand. Kenapa memangnya, Dok? Tanyaannya. Itu, Ibu. Uh, tadi kan seperti yang dikatakan sama Mr. Lewis bahwa New Zealand itu kan merupakan salah merupakan uh, negara pertama yang memiliki eh yang mencoba uh, Christ Cultural atau Christchurch itu. Uh, dan apakah tadi kan juga ter uh, Tadi juga itu bahasanya mengenai emisi gas rumah kaca gitu. Uh, jadi, uh, apakah ada hubungannya dengan emisi gas rumah kaca itu? Dan apakah dalam um, Christ Cultural itu ada permasalahan terbesar dalam um, menghadapi hal tersebut? Masih ya, um, saya yakin uh, Christ Cultural. Louis, did you mention about Christ cultural was it? Did you mention anything about that? Or oh, probably I missed it. Uh, no, but 
I can talk about the population makeup if you'd like. We're no, no, oh, okay. no, probably it's just it. I mean, I don't think there is a Chris cultural, but probably it's about the questions you mentioned in the South Bata Island. Uh, however, I tried to rearrange the questions. Probably it's just almost the same like the previous questions about the uh, carbon trading. Um, what is the biggest problems actually with this carbon? <laughs> From that, to simplify the questions, what are the problem with the G GHG? I mean, the carbon things. Why it becomes so important? That's for New Zealand. Why do you need to deal with this? Um. Well, glo globally, there's a lot of push on climate change because. There's the IPCC, which is the International Panel for Climate Change, and they've outlined now with quite high certainty that climate change is going to have substantial impacts on the world. Um, if you look at the climate modelling, perhaps not really until 2050, but the Western world has to address its emissions. I don't believe the developing world... Uh, will get there, but it's going to rely on a lot of technologies. Um, sort of think the way it would work is that hopefully we'd be able to help developing countries reduce their emissions, but a lot of the Western world is quite concerned at what the impacts are, as well as who's producing the emissions and why they aren't taking accountability for it. So I think you can't really go anywhere in the world to a political forum where climate change wouldn't be front of mind, at least in the developing world, that is. So as a result, a lot of governments are creating policy to try and address climate change. You've got two, you've got mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is reducing your actual emissions and adaptation is adapting to climate change. So in terms of the mitigations, that's where we are not too good in the agriculture sector and where we're trying to reduce our emissions. But talking before about trade, a lot of the countries which we trade to, their governments are looking at us and saying, you are producing a lot of emissions as a result of this. Why are you not doing anything? So there's a considerable risk for New Zealand if we don't do anything to address this issue because we may lose market access. And without market access, we are uh, not in a good position. So there's two answers to that question. The first is that there will be impacts of climate change for New Zealand and the people who will be affected the most are farmers because they are reliant on the weather outside. The second is that the farmers won't have any produce to send to current markets in the short term if they don't think that we're doing enough to address this issue. Thank you very much, Louise. I think uh, I, I try to understand what's, what's going on with our students because uh, probably carbon trading in Indonesia itself is just, we just try, try to start it. And many people from the industry, they understand very well because there is a TFND, TFCD. I, I'm not so sure whether you understand about that. There is a requirement to put more report on what the carbon that you are using. And now the increasing requirement is also the carbon trading for industry. But however, us in the, in the university level, especially for our students, we just try to introduce slowly that carbon climate change is, is also part of the, that impact agriculture issue. But however, we still try to slowly um, introduce our students about what is sustainability, what is climate change impact, because we can't really, especially if there's a small holders, they can't really feel it, do they? But for the big fan, of course, it's easy. To... I, I guess adding to that, Australia, who are our next door neighbours, they don't have carbon market. A lot of countries in the world, it's very new to, and when I was at agriculture, it wasn't on the radar. Yes. So just for context, this is very new a lot of people were still trying to figure out the intricacies of how it works. And although New Zealand has tried to do stuff, um, like most people I talk to don't understand, there's probably a specialty which I have, 
So it's not as though everyone in New Zealand is on board or understands what's going on, but I would definitely highlight the importance of getting your head around how it works and carbon accounting. Um, and I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but um, it will become a part of farming as just another metric, I think, because, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, that's using this uh, platform for kind of lecture. Now, uh, also, our students start to understand that this is very important for developed countries. However, we can't feel it yet. And we shouldn't even know about how to measure it. We, we, we don't know how it can really strongly relate to it. We understand climate change is there, but about the, especially about the carbon trading itself. I mean, that we just try to introduce it. But thank you for highlighting, because I understand you are from the GH, this climate change expert, are you? Um, my boss is. <laughs> I don't think I call myself an expert, but I just happen to know enough to get me by. Um, but we were developed the carbon pricing, and yeah, I know enough to, to get by yeah. about it, but yeah. Yeah, but what, I, what I'm scared if I try to be critical, I'm afraid this is kind of the new business in the future. If, if you can buy the certificate from those countries in order to trade with those industries who did more work. I don't know. That's how I try. I try to be, um, try to see <laughs> well, how it works in the future because it can be a huge business for people. I know it can be a balancing thing, but however, we also can see the big industry. I mean, once the certain amount is reached by them about the carbon or emissions that they have produced, and then they can buy from other industry or other, um, like, let's say from the NGO who produce tree, uh, not produce trees, who would plant trees or they do like community service things. And after that, they can claim that, okay, I do go overboard with this level. However, I can buy from others and can claim that what I'm doing is balancing things with what those people are doing. Uh, anyway, it's uh, 8.20. I'm, um, gosh, no more questions coming. So probably, is it okay for the last questions? Only last question, please, Luis, or you need to go. Is it okay for the last one? So I believe there is, uh, uh, from Ali Humaydi, uh, of all the existing challenges, how does the New Zealand government guarantee the sustainability of agriculture from generation to generations of every farmer? Because Indonesia, being farmer, is a profession that look down upon, and many graduate from agriculture, they do not want to go into agriculture itself, in which cause uh, probably in the future, the agriculture in Indonesia may decline. Probably you can provide us motivations as well. Um, no, I, th I think that's a global problem to a degree. Uh, what's happened in New Zealand is that the land prices have gone up exponentially over the last 10, 20 years to a point where it's becoming unattainable to buy a farm without crippling long-term debt. We've become very familiar with low interest rates, perhaps they inflated asset valuation, we now have to account for externalities and capital production. So it's very likely that land prices are no longer uh, linked to the productive capacity. So in New Zealand, we're facing this problem as well. A lot of the family farms, the succession is an absolute nightmare. And I could only imagine look, it's a global problem. We're quite bad at succession planning as farmers because we get good at farming and then forget that someone will have to take over the farm. Um, it's not possible. I, I guess the families in New Zealand are getting smaller, so it's very common to have one or two children. Whether they want to take over the farm is another question. As you've pointed out, it's not a sexy industry. I can come and sit in my office every day while it's raining and do work as opposed to being outside chasing animals, which can be appealing to some people. Um, so it's, it's certainly a problem in New Zealand. And what we may be seeing is that big corporate companies are slowly buying the land which people can no longer afford. 
and then running it as a corporate structure. So the conversation which we are now having is, is it okay to work on a farm and not to own the farm? And in New Zealand, there's been a mentality that if you work on a farm, you should own a farm, but we might have to start changing this, but it might solve some problems around labor. So they won't, they will have problems with labor, which they'll have to address and they might have better ways to do it. So it's up and downs, but certainly we have the same problems. Like, would you like me to answer a few of the other questions in the chat? I can probably got time. Are you okay with that? I think uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, one yeah. more question. Oh, two more questions. Is, are you are you sure? Are you okay? Yeah. No. That's... Probably let's just mix them together if, if they are aligned. Uh, the next question is um, what what is it? What company is he in? I mean you. But <laughs> what company are you in? And what kind of agricultural productions or industry that are you in? Um, although I already explained that you are in the like first, but I explained to some students that he is a consultant, but he also has a business actually. I mean, your, your parents' farm business where I visit it. And then oh, that one first, or directly with that last question is probably about the policies that re reducing the agricultural subsidies that you mentioned 1984, which affect the production management. And uh, how come they... How come the policy that reducing subsidies affect this production's management in your sector, especially if you try to relate with diversifications and innovation? Does it impact that much for these subsidy reductions? Um, yep. So the first question, Ag First is a consultancy company based in New Zealand. We're quite generalists. Predominantly, we work for the sheep and beef sector, red meat and dairy. So dairy cows, we have other consultants in parts of New Zealand who do horticulture and we don't do very much forestry or anything in the aquaculture industry. But we work with farmers, uh, processors and central government. So we sort of do everything. Um, sheep, beef, dairy and horticulture, I guess, in, in essence. Um, in terms of what happened in 1984, probably from 1960s onwards, New Zealand depended on subsidies quite a lot. Um, the policy was to try and increase our economy, so they helped the farmers to increase exports. But what we've learned the hard way was that if you have subsidies and you're predominantly exporting, it distorts any trade signals and trade signals tell you how you should be producing. So as opposed to getting market signals, which should be feeding into what you're doing, it was just flat line. There was no, we weren't getting anything from the market. We were just being told to produce stuff and to produce more of it. When 1984 happened, a lot of stuff occurred. We lost agriculture subsidies. They changed the exchange rate from a fixed to a floating rate. So the depreciation overnight, New Zealand dollar lost 30%. So you, like it was pretty substantial. Um, and basically as a result, a lot of people lost their farms because they weren't profitable and were too reliant on subsidies. However, it led to the intensification of the agriculture industry and a lot of innovation. So there's a thing called rotational grazing, which is quite big on farms, whereby animals will graze one cell and then move to another cell. Before that, we did what was called set stocking, where we just put animals out to the pasture and brought them in when we needed to. So we had better management for that. And that was largely through subdivision, making more fences, water, infrastructure, and fertilizer. So those were three key inputs. And we created what's called an electric fence. I'm not sure if you uh, have them, but it means you touch it and you get fried. Um, <laughs> that was a New Zealand invention by a guy called Gallagher. Um, so it was a, a really great time for the partial industry in terms of what people came up with. As I mentioned, a lot of consolidation and intensification. We also had market diversification occurring and land use change. So people did some really crazy stuff. 
we created a deer industry. We were just got a whole bunch of wild deer, rounded them up, and then created an industry out of it. Um, deer are hardly domesticated. Even the domesticated ones are still very not domesticated. We got into alpaca. Um, we got into ostrich, emu. Kiwi fruit occurred around this time. So there was a lot of people who tried to do different things. It required quite a bit of work and a lot of them ended up falling over. But from the ashes came the phoenix. Kiwi fruit has been a substantially profitable sector and is a great example of something which occurred. Um, but I guess as a result of what really happened from 1984, we're now dealing with the consequences, which was ultimately increased um, inputs resulting in externalities. So it had a huge impact on any farm management policies and diversification. It was really brutal, but now we've perhaps got quite a bit of problems with uh, climate change, water quality, and the other stuff a as a result. So it's sort of gone into a big circle. Um, but everyone talks about 1984. Well, not everyone, but people always point on it. It was huge. And, and New Zealand is very under the impression that we should not have subsidies if we export. And perhaps to add to that, as we deal with climate change, we start to see subsidies creep back in. And it's a very good question as to whether or not we should have subsidies for this reason, because that, I mean, no one else is going to not have subsidies. Um, very long answer to your question, but hopefully that provided a bit of context. No, oh, that, that's awesome. Uh, finally, we also understand that um, every country, although I think that New Zealand is also have its own problem, actually, but but it's really great sharing with all of us today. Um, uh, sorry, darling. Oh, sorry, that's to my students. There is no more questions. It's all up to the time at thirty. Um, so, Louis, I would like to say deeply thank you for your kind sharing. Today is a really amazing guest lecture today. Um, there are around 300 students attending. Some of them were kicked out of the Zoom because of the overcapacity. And we also provided uh, the YouTube if there are other students who are interested in joining us, but they cannot come in. Actually, probably there are still many questions from our students because they, in the first time, they're still very shy what, 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 to, what to ask. But in the end, I believe they now try to understand first, they don't need to be scared of the any foreigner in speaking English. That's what we try to put on them mentally. So we are now in the international, internationally, what is it? We, our university, especially, we now try to go more international. So now we, we try to more get engaged with more international lecture. And we want our students to be able to uh be ready for like this kind of lecture and thank you very much for being very nice to them understand their english i mean the english is one of our biggest biggest challenge but thank you very much very kind um understanding on it and uh, secondly thank you very much for the great, great sharing this is really incredible that um we finally can understand those big differences between Indonesia and New Zealand, especially not, not only about the structure, but also about that each um, each country actually has its own challenges and its own um, advantages. And the last one is probably is last but not least is about how we understand that the world is not okay in terms of this farm like business and how we can move forward, especially about the climate change. I really love that you uh, start to highlight this issue to our students that in which, as I inform you, we try to slowly introduce to them what's going on with the uh, sustainability issue and also the climate change impact on our agriculture. And uh, do you have any last uh, message for our students probably? Um, oh, just two things. The first is my English is not easy to understand. Um, I'm from a farm and we aren't good at communicating. Uh, other countries such as America and Europe 
considerably easier to understand people. So sorry for exposing you to the worst aspects of the English language. Um, the other is that I have an email. So if you have any questions, you can send them through and hopefully I can get back at some stage. Um, and finally, enjoy your education. Everywhere in the world which I've been has different issues in the agriculture sector that at the end of the day, a lot of them are very similar. Uh, and whether you face them now or in the future, I'm sure that there's still a lot of similarities between any primary production. Um, although I did learn about the soil pH in parts of Western Java, and I don't think we have that problem in New Zealand, <laughs> very fortunately. Um, but enjoy your education and make the most of it. And good luck. Oh, that's very nice. Thank you. No, by the way, I can understand all the English now. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that I can understand every single that you say <laughs> today. Um, yeah. Anyway, no, your English is the best. Perfect. You own the language. So it's us who must learn for it. Any accents, British and American. I think it's, it has its own style. Anyway, thank you very much for everyone today. And once again, for um, Mr. Luis, uh, Luis Badley. You can call him Luis anyway, uh, by the way. And thank you very much for today. Thank you for everyone. Have a good day. And we'll close the sessions by uh, allow me to say Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Luis. Assalamualaikum. Mau bilang thank you Luis, silakan. Thank you Luis. Thank you Luis. Thank you. Saya bisa bilang thank you.